Hello, let's discuss adrenogenital syndrome. So you're in the hospital, a baby is delivered, you go in to look at the child and their genitals look something like this, wherein you can't really tell if you're looking at a guy or a gal. What do you do? How do you go about working that up? The first thing that you ought to do is probably get a karyotype so that you can screen for sex chromosome abnormalities because a problem with the X or Y chromosome or a lack thereof would lead to the sort of hermaphroditic appearance that you see on the screen. And if that comes back negative, they've got 46 and they're all fine, then you're going to be highly suspicious of enzymatic defects in the steroid biosynthesis pathway. Now, your adrenal glands are responsible for making the bulk of your body's steroid hormones. What's a steroid hormone? Well, it's a four-membered ring derivative of cholesterol. It's lipid soluble and steroids travel throughout the bloodstream and they cross membranes and then cross the nuclear membrane, bind to a target region of DNA with assistance from cofactors and initiate the transcription of particular genes. So you have three classes of steroid hormones, all of which are produced in your adrenals, which sit right on top of your kidneys. In the zona glomerulosa of your adrenal cortex, you produce mineralocorticoids, aldosterone being the prime example, and it serves to elevate your blood pressure by pulling sodium in from the collecting duct of the kidneys. Then you have your zona fasciculata in your adrenal cortex, where glucocorticoids, namely cortisol, are produced. Now, they're called glucocorticoids because their chief function is to raise your blood glucose. They're gluconeogenic, in fact, and they are generally hormones of activity. They're going to get you up and out of bed and going. Finally, the deepest layer of your adrenal cortex next to the adrenal medulla is your zona reticularis, where androgens, sex hormones, are produced. And the production of androgens is particularly important early on in life, but then also again in puberty, it's going to lead to the development of sexual, secondary sexual characteristics, such as the growth of breasts in females and the deepening of voice in males. Those are all processes that you need your sex hormones in proper place for. So this SDL is mad easy. There are three possible enzymes that can be out that you'll be tested about on boards. And they're again, enzyme deficiencies, meaning that the child has inherited a bad or broken copy of a protein from one parent, or maybe there was a mutation uh, somewhere in cell division. And the result of which being that the child just can't synthesize certain hormones due to these enzyme deficiencies. So you've got three enzyme deficiencies and there are two characteristic symptoms that we're gonna be relying upon to tell these enzyme defic deficiencies apart from one another. Some of them, two of them of the three are going to give you a kid with high testosterone. And so the big symptom for that is that you'll see ambiguous genitalia in females because they've got way too much testosterone. That's a guy thing, they don't need that. And then two of the three enzymes will give you hypertension due to a gross overproduction of mineralocorticoids, which bind to the collecting duct principle and alpha intercalated cells and pull in sodium at the cost of spitting out a potassium or a proton. So. Two of them give you too much testosterone, two of them give you hypertension, and that's it. That's the game that we're playing, real simple. So let's check out 21-hydroxylase deficiency. 21-hydroxylase converts progesterone to deoxycorticosterone, and it also converts 17-hydroxyprogesterone to 11-deoxycortisol. Now, if you don't have this enzyme, what that means is that you're not making aldosterone. So you'll be hypo natremic because you can't pull salt in at the level of the collecting duct. And so you'll be hypotensive as well. Also on the metabolic panel, you'll see a hyperkalemia and you'll see a metabolic acidosis because recall that whenever you pull in a sodium, you have to spit out a cation into the renal tubule. And usually it's potassium, but sometimes it's a proton. So you're unable to get rid of blood protons whenever aldosterone is not functioning. You'll also have low cortisol. So 
on a blood panel, what that means is that patient will have high adrenocorticotropic hormone. And that's an effort by the brain to stimulate cortisol production from the adrenals. But you can throw all the ACTH you want at the adrenals, it won't make anything because you're missing 21 hydroxylase. So another symptom associated with that high adrenocorticotropic hormone is hyperpigmentation as a result of excess melanocyte stimulating hormone. Because recall that proopiomelanocortinin is the precursor for ACTH, but also for MSH. And so that's going to go to the melanocytes in your skin and cause them to divide and proliferate. And you'll see focal areas of hyperpigmentation, usually along skin creases or on the gums. And so finally, looking at the androgens that are produced in the zona reticularis, you're going to have an excess of testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, DHEA, androstenedione, all of those androgens in these patients with the 21 hydroxylase deficiency because pregnenolone, which is derived from cholesterol, can't go down to aldosterone, that's blocked, and it can't go to cortisol, that's blocked. And so the only way that this biomolecule can go is over to DHEA. And so it does that, and that's the testosterone excess leading to early puberty in boys and ambiguous genitalia in girls. That's it. So now let's look at 11 hydroxylase deficiency. So you make pregnenolone from cholesterol, but because you don't have 11 beta hydroxylase, you still can't make aldosterone and you still can't make cortisol. So the same thing is happening in 11 that's happening in 21 deficiency. You've got an excess of testosterone, too much DHEA, too much androstenedione, too much dihydrotestosterone. So same findings, girls will have ambiguous genitalia, boys will hit puberty early, things like uh, early baldness, very deep voice, uh, large body habitus. But there's a different metabolic finding in 11 hydroxylase deficiency compared to 21. You have hypertension in 11 hydroxylase deficiency, whereas you had hypotension in 21 hydroxylase deficiency. And you might be thinking, how do you have hypertension? Because you can't make any aldosterone, so you're losing sodium in the renal tubules. And while it's true that you're not making any aldosterone, you are making a ton of this one molecule, 11-deoxycortisol. And friends, I want to tell you that 11-deoxycortisol has weak mineralocorticoid agonistic activity, which means that 11-deoxycortisol can bind the aldosterone receptor and induce the same cellular effects on principal cells and alpha intercalated cells of the collecting duct that aldosterone can. So you don't just have a normal amount of 11-deoxycortisol. Because of these enzymatic deficiencies, you've got a stupid high amount of 11-deoxycortisol. So you have enough 11-deoxycortisol to where it's as if you had aldosterone still. So you'll still see the high adrenocorticotropic hormone because cortisol is not there to feedback inhibit the production of ACTH at the pituitary level. And you'll also see skin hyperpigmentation later on in these patients. But you can manage those ACTH-related symptoms with exogenous glucocorticoids. So big difference between 11 and 21 is hypo versus hypertension. And then we get to 17 hydroxylase deficiency, which means that pregnenolone after it's created from cholesterol can't go to its 17 hydroxy relatives and it's stuck going all the way down to aldosterone. So the result of a 17 hydroxylase deficiency is an extremely elevated blood aldosterone level leading to hypertension as you're pulling in sodium through ENAC epithelial sodium channel down in the kidneys. And you're going to get a metabolic alkalosis because you are spitting protons out into the tubule in exchange for that sodium that you're pulling back in. And you would also see a hypokalemia in these patients. Now, these patients with the 17 hydroxylase deficiency are not going to have any testosterone. Very, 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 very low levels. Way down. No DHEA, no androstenedione. So do you think that girls with 17 hydroxylase deficiency will have ambiguous genitalia? I don't. 
because they won't have testosterone excess. So on the flip side, it's boys with 17 hydroxylase deficiency that would present with ambiguous genitalia because testosterone is necessary for male genital maturation. Girls, on the other hand, will develop normally initially, but once they reach middle, late childhood, teenage years, they're going to be pretty small for their age because although girls don't produce as much testosterone as boys, they still make some and testosterone is a very tropic hormone all over the body. It's going to make you grow. So you'll see stunted growth in girls. And that's really it for this SDL. Uh, understand that this chart is laid out coincidentally, analogously to the three layers of the adrenal cortex. Very handy chart. Understand that the most superficial layer, the zona glomerulosa, is where you make mineralocorticoids. The middle layer, the zona fasciculata, is where you make glucocorticoids. And the deepest layer, the zona reticularis, is where you make androgens. So if you memorize this flow chart, you've memorized all the layers of the adrenal cortex and you'll never have to return to it again. So that's about all that I have. I'll scroll through this SDL quickly and point out other testable concepts. Very rarely you see virilization. That just means uh, development of traits of the opposite sex. You'll see virilization in an older adult patient due to an adrenocortical carcinoma, but these are very, very rare cancers. Uh, they might produce symptoms in females, such as uh, balding, hair loss, and maybe a deeper voice. You might also see a upregulation of cortisol and aldosterone anytime you have an adrenal tumor, uh, because those cells, as long as they're well differentiated, will retain the ability to synthesize mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, depending on what layer of the adrenals gets the cancer. And so you could see Cushing syndrome or Kahn syndrome downstream from that tumor. Now, congenital adrenal hyperplasia is synonymous with, it's the umbrella term for those three enzyme deficiencies we just discussed. And the reason why your adrenals are hyperplastic, what does that mean? That means that cells are proliferating at, a, at an accelerated rate. They're growing a lot. Why are they growing? Because you don't have cortisol. In all three of these enzyme deficiencies, you're missing cortisol. So there's no feedback inhibition of adrenocorticotropic hormone. So you're throwing ACTH at the adrenals, and it's a tropic hormone. It's a growth factor, so it gets those cells to divide. 21 hydroxylase deficiency is by far the most common. Play odds. Golion always says that. I think that is uh, how you approach breaking down a question. What's the most likely? And that's how you approach it in real life, too, you know? So I would memorize the whole flow chart here. It'll serve you well in physio, certainly, if not path. The genes that are deficient in all of these enzyme deficiencies are serendipitously named cytochrome, insert number of the hydroxylase. So for 21 hydroxylase, the protein, the gene you're missing is CYP21. For 11, it's CYP11. For 17, it's CYP17. And they are all autosomal recessive, so I don't think we'll get tested on genes for this lecture. Understand that if the patient has low blood sodium, they've got too little aldosterone because aldosterone reabsorbs sodium. And then conversely, if you have hypernatremia, hypertension, you've got too much aldosterone. And then cortisol, again, that's gluconeogenic. Symptoms of Cushing's include adiposity, thin limbs, uh, hirsutism, facial rashes, GI symptoms. The screening marker of choice for 21 hydroxylase deficiency is going to be 17 hydroxyprogesterone. I can see that getting asked in ClinMed, if not PATH. And you have a couple of, you have a variant 21 hydroxylase deficiency. The classic form means you don't have the enzyme, whatever. And so that's due to a nonsense mutation. Remember our different types of mutation. You could have a nonsense, a missense, a frame shift, a deletion, etc. A nonsense mutation means that 
whatever protein picks up a nonsense mutation is going to totally lose functionality, 0% of functionality. But sometimes proteins can pick up a missense mutation and still retain functionality, albeit in a reduced form. So that's what's going on in the simple form of 21 hydroxylase deficiency. You've got one to 2% of your normal enzymatic activity, which might not sound like a lot, but it's a lot more than zero. So these patients have a way lesser degree of hypotension because they're still making a tiny little bit of aldosterone. And you're not going to see any symptoms of cortisol deficiency either because you're still making a little bit of cortisol. Here's the Prater scale. Remember, two of these three, the 21 and 11 hydroxylase deficiencies are going to give you females with ambiguous genitalia. However, the 17 hydroxylase deficiency, you're not making testosterone, so males present then with ambiguous genitalia. Another visual example. Here are your big swollen adrenals because all the ACTH you can muster is getting thrown at them. That's why they are hypertrophic, hyperplastic. The gold standard for differentiating 21 hydroxylase deficiency from 11 and 17 deficiency is going to be the corticotropin stimulation test. And they really don't tell you how to interpret that test within page seven of this SDL. They just kind of tell you it exists. So I don't think we'll be expected to use that to make a diagnosis on a test question. And even then, you know, you can make the diagnosis if you have their blood sodium and if you have the picture of the genitals, you know. So how do we treat all of these? We give glucocorticoids to suppress ACTH. 11 hydroxylase deficiency, one out of 20, one out of 10 cases, again, presents in infancy and early childhood. The molecules in red will all be elevated in the blood. So we said that 17 hydroxyprogesterone was going to be very high in 21 deficiency, uh, but it's going to be pretty normal in 11 deficiency. And then it's just going to be totally absent in 17 hydroxylase deficiency. So 17 hydroxyprogesterone is really the hub of this entire grid. This table on page nine here, the only two rows you really need to understand are What's happening to the sex hormones? Are your androgens up or down? What's happening to blood pressure? Is it going up or down? And two of these are going to show you hypertension. That's 11 and 17. Then 21 is going to show you hypotension. And then two of these are going to show you increased testosterone. And that's 11 and 21. Easy, easy, easy diagnosis. Just memorize it. Urinary 17 ketosteroids may be elevated if they try to throw you that thing on the test where they don't call it DHEA, they call it 17 ketosteroids. You know, what would you expect to see in the patient's urine? Elevated 17 hydroxycorticoids. Well, that just means 11 deoxycortisol and cortisol. So the patient would not have any 17 hydroxycorticoids. But in two of these three, the 21 and the 11 hydroxylase deficiencies, you would see elevated 17 ketosteroids. So that's just synonymous with your androgens. That's another way they could phrase that on the test. Finally, 17 hydroxylase deficiency. Remember, that's the one where you can't make androgens. And so not only do you need glucocorticoids to suppress adrenocorticotropic hormone here, you're also going to want spironolactone to blunt and mitigate the effects of the excess aldosterone that this patient is making. And then once they start hitting puberty, you're going to give them sex hormone replacement therapy. And that's it for this SDL. Thanks.